Uh, okay, so starting over, uh, my name is Matt Simchek, CEO of Zigar, and we have a virtual dressing room platform called the Webcam Social Shopper. Uh, this graph shows just a, a few of the worldwide implementations of our software in uh, Malaysia, Denmark, US, and so on. Uh, we have the vir leading virtual dressing room platform in this space. Um, as you can see from 2009 to 2010, a lot of brands and retailers were coming to us for promotional purposes. It wasn't until about 2012 that we started to see more enterprise adoption and retailers looking at our software for more uh, for conversion. And then I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just, I feel like I'm, my stomach's really bad right now. Can we, I really apologize. Can we do a, a panel format? And I, I apologize everybody for this. I feel like really bad right now. Yeah, no, no, I've done this a hundred times. Oh. <laughs> I can speak to this with my eyes shut. It's just I'm not, my, I'm not feeling very well right now. It's yeah. So, Chris, can we do it? I need to. When you say a panel for that, what do you. Well, we can take questions oh, because I'm just, just want not. To do a &A. Yeah. I really apologize. I've never, never felt like this before. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, my, my stomach and my. Not feeling good right now. Well, if, um, so if the, if the audience, we're, we're just going to kind of shift, shift here and, and see if the audience has uh, any Q and A you'd like to hear. Um, do we have a microphone there in the back? Uh, yeah, hi, this is a question for you, Andrew. Um, how do you, so, so basically, based on your, um, there's this game, you're collecting points, and who, and how does it work after that? Are you redeeming for coupons? Is it a tie up with the actual retailer? Who's paying for the coupons? Great question. Right now, the retailer, the way we work, is we're not automated yet. You know, our goal is to be. Right now, we work for events. Um, so the retailer will pay like a set amount of money, right? It's not really that much. And they are basically the title sponsor of an entire challenge. I think a lot of tech people here, we call it the environment. So what we end up doing is, can you guys hear me with this better? Yeah. So what we end up doing is uh, basically taking like the logos that have already paid them uh, money and we just act as another delivery system. You know, uh, it's really just kind of like walking around with a, a portable, you know, billboard on you. But uh, the, the marketer pays for that deal that's linked behind that coin. In fact, do we have any pay-per-click pay people here? Anyone that runs like AdWord campaigns? I, anyone know about Google AdWords? Yeah, advertising, right. So if you can just kind of think like, you know, you click on a game piece and you know, the same metrics apply, you know, CPC models still come into play. Uh, there's like one new variation, which is the redemption. Like when you claim a coupon, if you think like a scavenger hunt or an Easter egg hunt, right, if one, you know, three eggs have jelly beans in them, other ones have $5 bills in them, right, we work the exact same way. Uh, you know, when you open up that Easter egg, you know, it'll either be jelly beans or like a $5, but you store it in your um, individual like user account. We call it a prize vault. And you can go and redeem that. Uh, either it can be time sensitive or it can be, you know, for the lifespan of, of that coupon. Same, same rules apply. Uh, when you get to that retailer, we can integrate with a POS for like a mobile payment for those that don't have micros. You know, we find that when we work at outdoor events, not every retailer is tied into a credit card where they can upsell the consumer. I think we kind of learned that the hard way doing a campaign with uh, Mike's Herd Lemonade out in San Diego. You know, we can guide a consumer by getting a coupon, you know, go to the cotton candy booth and get some free cotton candy. Okay, so we're getting more consumers to go to, you know, booth 122, two, uh, but then, you know, we, we failed to identify a POS initially. Uh, they said, okay, would you like to buy some sodas? Oh, yeah, I'd love to, but I only have a debit card. Oh, well, I don't have micros. So to take it one step further, we can then take that coupon and get a credit card to uh, then allow the vendor to upsell the person. So then money's made kind of two different ways. Yeah, so. Yes.
Hi. I realize that everyone is more business oriented here. Uh, it's more for total immersion. Um, you know, there's a lot of, been a lot in the media about you know patents and innovation and that. And the scariest thing you said towards the end of your conversation, your presentation was, you know, a lot of people, you know, any of the new companies kind of getting in here, you know, I wish them luck because you have all these patents. Do you think that you know that's a good message to? Yeah, as far as the business side, I understand that there's money involved, but as far as innovation and AR, you know, there's a lot of AR developers here. Like, is so, that so, so we're not claiming that we have all the patents, otherwise Thomas is going to stand up and uh, start fighting with me. Uh, no, I mean, they, yeah. Uh, no, no, I mean, they, it's, it's obvious that over the past few months, we have seen a lot of uh, movement, I would say, in the uh, uh, patents um, area. And... Um, Definitely here, as I said, it's, uh, it's, it's getting tougher and tougher to, to expose what, what the patents we have and the patents what I, I other AR company uh, has. Uh, and for, for the new like, company launching AR solution, they're going to they're gonna have to fight pretty hard, not against us, or just us, but uh, against the other AR players that are claiming that they have also AR patents. Uh, so I think, and I think that fight is just, uh, it's just starting. Uh, I think that fight is going to, fight is going to be extremely uh, um, um, costly. It's going to cost a lot of, a lot of money, um, and we, it's, it's not pretty sure yet uh, uh, what's what's going to what's, what's going to get out of it. What we're just seeing here, uh, as a matter of fact, that we have the oldest AR patent because we started the company. We're the first AR business company ever. Uh, having said that, it's it's not my job to say in front of you that uh, our patent is better than the other one and so on. I'm just saying that in terms of anteriority, we feel pretty much comfortable that we are we are we, we are securing our AR application with our own AR patents. That's it. I'd like to add one thing to that. I think we're going to add a couple things to the, your question over here. The gentleman in the back of the room that just asked a question about the patent is he still paying attention? <laughs> the guy with the hat on. The, yeah, so we actually have two more points to add with you. We're super new. We were, we've only been in this space for two years. We filed a patent, location-based augmented reality, content delivery system management. And uh, we did our research, our law firm did. I can tell you, it costs 12 grand. There's like a provisional side, and then it goes into pending. If you can just know that, be willing to part with 12K, have a lawyer that just does this for a living, do their research, they'll see what's out there. I mean, they saw some of your stuff, they saw some other people's stuff, and they'll figure out a way based on their you know, law degrees to file you properly. Just tell them what you do, what you're trying to accomplish, and they'll find a way to make it happen for you. It took us a year. Yeah, I, it might have taken two weeks out of my life to write a thing called a mach machine process. It, it's not hard, you can do it. And we filed it and there was no issues during research. So you're, I think you're gonna be fine. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add one thing onto that. And, uh, for uh, for patents, I actually, um, again, I apologize for not getting through the presentation, but we were uh, recently issued a virtual dressing room patent, which is a key patent in the AR and virtual dressing room space. But what we look at is is uh, a patent is basically helps say innovate, don't replicate, because what we've been seeing, especially in our in, in the space as it pertains to AR and uh, virtual dressing rooms and commerce, is there's a lot of replication going on from different tech companies and other retailers that. If you don't have patent protection as a smaller company, there's no way you're ever going to grow your product because a, a larger tech company is just going to replicate what you have and just move in the market with the billions of dollars they have. So uh, I do think patents are very important. There's a lot of different patents in this space. It, it will get bloody because there are so many different patents, but it is, it is critical, I think, to any company entering this space that you have patent protection. Yeah, it certainly makes you sleep a little better at night, but... So this is a question for, I guess, everyone on the panel. Um, so as Scott mentioned, content is king. And how do you address the issue of content creation for retailers and brands who have tens of thousands of SKUs in their product catalog? And you have uh, you know, different cadence of uh, product life cycle, and you know, certainly like in the apparel industry, where you have you know, long lead times and short times to market, uh, or short times in market. How would you? recommend a retailer sort of address the, the content creation issue in terms of cost and timing? 
Great question. Um, we're facing this now. We've got certain clients who have thousands of SKUs. Um, it's about building the right team and replicating that team over and over again internally, uh, finding a, a system inside, whether it be cloud-based, uh, but a content resource that allows you to distribute this content quickly. Um, one of the issues we've faced is obviously Apple. Uh, people want to be able to deliver a content on the Apple iTunes account Problem is, it takes seven to 10 days, and sometimes clients want it a little bit sooner than that. Uh, there's ways around it. Um, we're working on a process now with cloud-based delivery systems. If you create a process internally, the technology, like we talked about before, is not that difficult. Um, you have content, and you have a flow and a process. It's just building a team and replicating that. Um, you make it simple and easy to use, uh, and not make it complex. Uh, Bruno's very good at looking at that aspect of it, and we have done that as well. Um, we can produce. Um, two books a month, you know, we produce, uh, we produced 11 video games in less than a quarter, and that's because there's a process to it. You build on the, the dynamics that you've got. Um, don't get so far into the tech that you get lost, that the technology behind that is very simple. It's just interaction. Um, you keep it simple, you keep it easy, and consumers understand something, they like it. If consumers don't know how to do something, don't know how to um, get interested in it, they get lost. And I think uh, this whole panel understands that. We, we go into the, the market very simply with this whole idealism that it's the technology that sells. It's not. It's the content that sells. And the enhancement has to be associated with that technology. So, Yeah, just to add a, few, a quick comment on that one. Um, we took that uh, issue very seriously uh, for one reason. is pricing. If we charge like $1,000 per asset and you have like 6,000 or 10,000 assets, you're dead. I mean, nobody is going to spend like 10 or 50 million dollars to build three assets. So uh, I'm not going to share our trade secrets today, but uh, uh, I'm going to put it that way. Uh, we have some clients, and we succeed in developing some solution where we can like digitize assets very quickly, uh, efficiently, with high quality. Most of our e-commerce players they have thousands of assets, and uh, and uh, we came with a very affordable price which uh, uh, totally unlocked this business. Uh, I mentioned a little bit about uh, the Trilive uh, cloud solution, which is, which is also a critical component to make it work, so because then you need to manage these assets, to upload them and to uh, validate them and so on. Um, th that's why coming with a full 360 solution from like content creation to AR delivery, it is totally critical for, uh, for all the e-commerce players. And just one thing to add on that, from uh, you know, from the apparel end, what we're seeing with a lot of retailers are, when when a when an e-commerce retailer or a retailer for that matter is going to do a photography shoot or apparel shoot for a new line coming out, they don't usually they don't have the budget for 3D for 3D assets. It's just it's not there. It's not when they do a photography shoot. It's easier to do different rotations of an item uh, for different you know back front side. But when you get into 3D, you're looking at creating uh, 3D apparel items are not created as uh, CAD models, for instance. They're created as they're, they're, you have to create. They're created as a sketch, and then you have to take that and then create a texture-based model and then animate it through a physics engine. So, for right now, uh, 3D assets just aren't a scalable cost for retailers. And as soon as the quicker that becomes uh, more efficient and lifelike and uh, cost effective for retailers, I think we'll see a greater adoption of that. And that's pretty much it. I saw a guy downstairs with a bunch of cameras in a circle. You guys know the name of that company? And how cool to be if it, that thing was portable and you could just walk in there with whatever clothes you want on, shoot the picture, and then from there we could just upload it right into AR. There's mobile phones that do that now. Either. Yeah, you just use that. But I was going to close that up. I know you said for the whole panel. I think if you can just identify, are you trying to be the next Adobe? Are you trying to be the next like Instagram? I, you know, both people are making just the same amount of money. One has a crap ton more overhead than the other one, but their exits are still their exits. It's either you know, two, three, four, five, six if they're lucky, exit multiples. And if you're okay with that, and that's why you got into this space, identify from day one. Are you trying to be the next, you know, Instagram? Or are you trying to go out and compete with the total immersion, the Matayo, you know, and be the next Adobe of AR? You're going to be fine either way. I want to really put that out there because we were very intimidated when we first got into this space. And I think at some point you just come up with a, look, we're just going to jump in. We know who we are, where we're going. Let's just stick on this course. I think you're going to be just fine. Do you guys have time for one more question? Because we've already gone over a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Well, go ahead. I 
This is just for the panel. Uh, could someone give me the distinction between people who do really great CGI and augmented reality? <laughs> I, I like how I got this. Um, okay. uh, AR is interactive. Think of AR as a gaming platform. Um, and the gaming platform is a little bit different than CGI that you're going to see in the studios. Uh, we don't have the processing power just yet with a lot of the mobile devices that are in the market. And that's pretty much the issue that we've got is everything's got to be scaled down just a little bit. Some of the gaming that we see on phones is different than what we're seeing actually in the movies. And so our CGI, our polygon counts, our frame rates are all related to this as well. So as we evolve, we're going to see a lot better content get produced and a lot better interactions that are going to happen. A lot of what we've seen in the last two to three years has been very simple interactions, very simple content. When you have things that are uh, display, such as uh, in-store fashion and in-store dress rooms, you can control that environment because you've got a controlled device that's running it. When you're using a mobile phone, you, it's a potluck. What do they have? Do they have the old version of an iPhone? Do they have an iPod? So you, you've got to face the lowest common denominator when building a platform or building any type of interaction. And that's what we're faced with. Everybody wants to see the latest and greatest, but if it doesn't run on my phone, it doesn't work. And so you've, you've got to focus on that. And it's a gaming platform first, um, and then the interactions next. So. Uh, I just but I, I work for a special effects studio uh, in, in the past. And it, it's really about, think about, resolution of screens, like when, you know, the way video games used to look in the 80s and how high resolution they look now. And, and it's kind of the same thing. When you're dealing with CGI and you're dealing with stuff in special effects studios for movies, um, it doesn't have to be rendered in real time. It doesn't have to be rendered in real time. It doesn't have to be rendered on a slow processor. So, you know, you, you have workstations and, and dedicated server farms that are doing nothing but rendering frame by frame at super high resolution. And you can go and you can build all of your models and all of your animation and then leave for the weekend and let it do nothing but render frames. And then you have, you know, your, your final content in the form that's going to be shown in a movie as opposed to when you're doing something in AR. It has to be something that, that can be processed on a much slower processor that can be processed in real time. And so you have what are called like polygon counts as opposed to pixel counts. And it's just like the number of facets and the complexity that the models can have. If there's anybody else who wanted to add anything? That's it. OK, I think we need to, uh, we need to switch out this room for the next panel. Please come back. Um, we will have AR and automotive and tourism here at 1130.